Thank you for all your hard work, guys. They always do such a good job. And I know she's probably not in the room, but I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you were here yesterday, Miss Bev herds cats. She was like, she like smacked my hand, wouldn't even let me steal a cookie because she had them counted. Um, but there was kids from all over the neighborhoods here yesterday. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful time. On the social media pages, we have some videos of, of the things going on. But, man, she did an amazing job. She always does. Give her a hug and let her know how much you love her. Yeah, just let her know how much she's appreciated. Uh, if, if you know anything about her, she's going through a lot in her personal life right now. And, and a hug might just do her amazingly good. So let her know how much we appreciate her. Uh, before we get into the message, and I, I spoke this last service, but I did not actually say it when we started. And this is what the Lord told me to do. Um, if you're going through something and the enemy has you drugged down, I'm going to give you a line, a sentence. You ready? You're probably not going to like it, but that's okay. Uh, true revival to be revived. True revival starts with true repentance. Now, when the Lord gave me that last week during revival in Roseburg, I spoke it out, and I didn't comprehend what it meant to me. But before I get, before I get into the message, I'm going to share with you for just a second. What it meant to me was this. We're not talking about like, you know, going out and sleeping with the neighborhood or stealing or killing or those things. We're not talking about sin like that. But for allowing the enemy to drag me down, instead of having the faith I needed to walk through it, knowing that God had the enemy already overcome, I allowed him to drag me down some through all the processes of my life that was going on. And God didn't tell me to rebuke the enemy. God told me to repent. Because it's not my place to let the world overtake me when the God that lives in me has overcome the world. So when I spoke that out, I didn't grasp the concept. But as I watched preachers, and, and there was like seven preachers in the room, and I watched them come and start repenting before God, and I stopped and began to listen to what God said. He says, when you let the enemy win, you have to repent for that. And all of a sudden, revival began to break out in Roseburg. So I'm going to say this to you. If you're going through something in your life, if you want to be revived, true revival begins with true repentance. That's all I'm going to say on that. Moving on. Now give him a hallelujah in the house. Uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 12, thank you for coming out on this Resurrection Sunday, if you're an elder, look around at those that are not here, maybe they're visiting family, but probably be nice to give them a call and say, hey, we missed you. We do appreciate all the guys back there while you're looking that up, the new screens that they put up, the new, not the screen, but the new uh, projectors, new sound system equipment, and uh, the blessing that someone gave that audio department, they're putting it to good use. And so we're proud of them. Uh, much more to come, right? Amen. So the live stream next week, we hope to be running much better uh, with, with a little better equipment too. So stand with me, if you will. Revelation 12, verses 9 and 10. Uh, and when I say Revelation, I know that 99.9372168 percent of the world call it the revelations it's not it's one revelation it's the revelation of Jesus Christ written by John through the uh, through the Holy Spirit's guidance so it is the revelation of Jesus Christ and uh, verse 9 says and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of his brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Father, thank you for your word today. I thank you that you are in our midst. 
Lord, I, I thank you for the resurrection. I thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the sweet Holy Spirit. I pray now that you would use my lips to speak life to your people, Lord. God, I pray that you would not let me speak anything you would not have me speak. If so, silence my lips, Father, that I would only honor you today. We give you praise in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. So this scripture is talking about Satan being cast out of heaven. And we know if you actually go study that, that's really neat. It's talked about in the Old Testament, talked about in the New Testament. Is it once? Is it twice? Is he kicked out more than once? Those are great things for you to study. That is not what we're studying today, actually. But it is a great thing to study because it is a very interesting portion of Scripture. But what we are studying is where it says after that, that he is the accuser of the brethren. That he is the accuser of the brethren. Now, Romans tells us this, that we were all born into sin, every single one of us. So the day you were born and you reach accountability, you're guilty. Now, you may not like that. It's always someone else's fault, right? Someone else did it. Someone. But the truth is this, we're guilty. So if you were sitting in a court of law, let's picture that God is sitting on the throne. He's sitting in the judge's seat. You're here, and the enemy is standing against you. And he has an entire list of things that you are guilty of. You are not going to get away with it because you are guilty of it. There's nothing you can do to get away with it. You are guilty. And the enemy is accusing you. Well, you know what he did there? Well, he did that. Well, he took that baby rattler. He did this. He did that. You know what? He stole that chewing gum at the store. He did this. He did that. He lust. He did this. She did that. And all those things, and you're guilty. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 2. Paul writing to the church at Colossae, and, and he's writing a letter to them, and he's talking about the Christ. The Christ, our risen Savior. And so let me precursor this before I dig into this. Uh, he is writing about, um, he is writing to them in part about things that man will say to you. Some of those things, if you read through this entire book, here's what it would say. It would say that don't let someone judge you in the food you eat. Because that's a thing that is going to come. People are going to judge you in that. And it says, don't let people judge you in a Sabbath day's worship because Christ fulfilled that. Now, that's what some of the things. But we're going to talk about sin and those things in, in the context with which we're saying it. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. So let's just stop right there for a minute. These guys will have it. They'll, they'll work with me. But here's what it says. If you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've truly repented before God and accepted him as Lord and Savior, walk with him. He did not say, say a prayer and do whatever. And let's be honest. True repentance is not saying a prayer. True repentance isn't saying, Father, forgive me, I'm out of here. True repentance is believing in Christ, not just in what he did, not just that he was a person, but believing in who he is. And when you truly believe, here's what happens in your life. The Bible says you're made a new creation, am I right? So here's one of the things that happens. I, and... and Please don't get offended at me. I love the old preachers. I love Brother Hughes that preached, uh, you know, messages like sinners in the hands of an angry God. I love those. But here's what I found out in my life. If I truly love the way that God loves, I won't want to sin. My spirit, my heart, the new man within me, I don't need to tell you if you're committing adultery that it's sin. Because you know in your heart that it's wrong. Yeah. Why do you think people say things like, judge not, judge not? Because deep down they know they're wrong inside. You've heard me say it a million times. Have you ever heard anybody use Buddha's name in vain? 
Have you ever heard anybody get mad in a, in a, maybe in a former life of yours in a bar and jump up and say, well, Muhammad! No, because they may proclaim to be an atheist and not believe there's a God, but deep down inside they know there's power in the name. That's why they use God's name in vain. That's why they proclaim, well, Jesus Christ, in a vain way, because they know deep down inside and I'm going to share this for a minute, then I'm going to get to the good stuff. But I want you to understand this. When you truly are saved and you love God, you want to do what pleases Him. Amen. You don't repent because you got caught. You don't cut, you do, and believe me, it helps to repent for that. But, uh, and it, but we repent sometimes when we have nothing else that everything's falling apart and we run back to God to get him to fix it. But when I truly repent, I'm sorry for hurting God. True repentance says, I hurt my heavenly father. I broke his heart and I want to fix that. It doesn't matter the consequences for what I did to me. What matters is I want to restore my relationship with my Heavenly Father. I don't want that broke. I don't want that because when I truly have Christ in my life, I want to honor Him. Any amens in the house? Verse 8. Beware lest any man spool you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let me give you a good rule of thumb. If someone says to you, you need Christ plus to get to heaven, Christ is what you need to get to heaven. An intimate, true relationship with Christ. I believe you need the Holy Spirit baptism to survive in this life. But to get to heaven, if anyone tells you, and this scripture's telling us, if they tell you you need anything plus Christ, if you truly get Christ, that's what you need. I didn't get any amens, but that's okay. That's okay. Don't let man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Let me qualify that one more time. I'm, I'm going to be good. I didn't say you need Christ and go on sinning. If you can go on sinning and there's nothing in your heart that's pricked, or torn up about that, you never got Christ to begin with. Because the new man is heartbroken when he breaks the heart of God. Is this okay for an Easter message? <laughs> Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain, and vain, and vain, and vain to sin, and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and powers. Verse, that was verse 10. Verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision not made, made without hands, and putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. So let's stop right here for a second. The enemy says you've sinned. You carried anger. You carried, you're mad at somebody, bitterness. Whatever it is, you, you've sinned. You're carrying that. Well, you don't know what they did to me. I know what they did to him, and it's a lot worse than what they've done to you. And if he can say, Father, forgive them, it's probably pretty easy for me to do the same. And he says, I will forgive all your sins if you will just accept me in. Love me and follow me. All your sins. The enemy says, you're guilty. He's the accuser of the brethren. 
And Jesus says, I dismiss all charges. I dismiss all charges against them. Can you grasp that this morning? See, the world wants you to feel guilty all the time because of what you did do. You know what Christians ought to do? When people say, well, dude, you were like, I mean, let's be real. Let's just use my life. When you went through this mess in your life, you became an alcoholic. You slept with every woman you could find. You never went home by yourself. You did this. You did that. You did that. Aren't you ashamed? You know what I'll say to you? Yes, I did all those things, but God brought me out of all those things. I'm not that creature anymore. And I'm very proud of the things he brought me out of. Not because I was in them in the first place, but because he set me free from them. Now, put yourself in that spot, right? Move on to verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. We're about to take communion, the new covenant. The old covenant, this is what he says about it. He literally says of the old covenant that he took and he blotted out the ordinances, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us because they were contrary to us because we could not fulfill them anyway. If you wanted to live under the law today, you would have to sacrifice in the temple in Israel at least once a year. There is no temple in Israel right now. You cannot fulfill that part of the law. You can't. If you're wearing clothes today, there's a real strong chance they're made of more than one fabric. That breaks the law. If you've eaten pork, you've broken the law. Catfish, you're from Oklahoma. You you was born eating catfish, brother. I know. I'm farther south than you were, and I know we ate catfish. They strained it up and put it in a bottle. They wanted you to know what it was. No, I'm just teasing. but. But listen to what he said. He said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. We couldn't fulfill it. We're not good enough. We're guilty. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, can I say this to you for all you guys that think I'm crazy? There's more laws in the New Testament than there was the Old. Truth is truth. There were 613 Old Testament laws, and there's more than 1,000 in the New Testament. So there's requirements that we have to abide by. And if we love God with all our heart, we will want to abide by those. Or at least if we break them, we will want to get forgiveness and attempt not to do that again. So when I can't fulfill the law of God, he says dismissed. Now I want you to listen to this next scripture. I'm almost halfway done. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And if you break this down in the original language, and I wish you would, I wish you would go home and do that. Here's what it says. That he took the enemy and every bit of authority that he had, let's say that Adam gave Satan the authority back in the Garden of Eden, and so, so he has this robe on him that says, I'm the prince and power of the air. And when Christ went to Calvary, it says that he spoiled, he disrobed the enemy. He took it away. He spoiled the enemy's power and authority. So you want to hear this one? The only authority the enemy has over you is what you give him. Now, that's not to say stuff's not coming your way, because it is, because we live in an evil world. You're going to have junk come your way. If you don't believe that, you probably need to read that book, because it's coming. But I want to show you something. What I do with what he gave me, and he gave me authority over that, 
is what matters because he dismissed the power of the enemy over you. It says he made a public spectacle of it. Triumphing over it, he made a public spectacle. Last point. I want to prove that point to you with my last point. How about this one? As of the time I left the house this morning, 207 people were dead in Sri Lanka in churches that were blown up. Now that's tragedy, am I right? It's ridiculous and it's tragedy. And this is what people are saying. I can't believe that the enemy would do that. I can't believe the enemy would do that. Well, let me share something with you. The enemy will do whatever he can. And we might believe that he had authority over them by doing that. But here's what actually happened. It's tragic. The grief is real. Every part of it is tragic. But if they truly knew Christ as their Lord and Savior, the enemy did not win a battle over 207 people this morning. 207 souls, if they truly knew Christ as their Lord and Savior, were not defeated by death. They were not defeated by death. The reality of it is this. They were delivered from this old rotten core that we live in, and they were set free to live on high with God. It's still tragic, it's still wrong, it's still sin that caused it, and the grieving is real. But the truth of the matter is, a little over 2,000 years ago, by our Gregorian calendar, Christ's got to come up out of the grave. And on the cross of Calvary, he defeated sin, and all the other stuff. But when he got up out of the grave, he defeated death. It no longer has a hold on God's people. Now the grieving is real for those left behind. Maybe even fear of death is real. But the death itself has been defeated. It's done. It's finished. Christ gave you resurrection power. And when you walk with him, and you serve him, and you live with him, you are set free even in death. There was a dear man in my life named Benedict Arnold Roach. A dear man. We called him Bug. I know, it's crazy, right? But he was dear to me, and I won't tell you how dear, but very dear. And he served God as much as any man I've ever met. And he was eat up with cancer. And they said, take him home. He's got about two months to live. And a few days later, I'm standing there. We'd set him on the couch, and out of the wheelchair on the couch. And he's got two months to live, right? And he said, you know what? I told everybody I love him. I want to go home. Papa, you're home. You are home. You're right here with us. I want to go home. Papa, you're home. It's the meds. It'll be okay, right? Boys, will you just take me and put me in bed? He's been home two days. We set him in the wheelchair. We roll him to the bedroom. We pick him up. We lay him in the bed. And he goes, ah. And he went home. He went home. And I don't know about you, but I love that man with everything in me. But I was rejoicing because he sat there and told us, I want to go home. And God said, come on home. For us that were left, it hurt. There was grieving and it was tragedy that cancer was there. But that death had already been defeated. And when we as the children of God, begin to understand and comprehend the love of God and begin to flow in it. All that stuff in your life don't mean as much as that stuff once did. 
I can't believe they hit my new car. They scratched my new car. It's just a car. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven if you follow Christ till the end. You've already won. You've never bought a car on payments. And they held the car till you were done, or you shouldn't have. If you did, you had a 213 credit score. But... Because you know what? Although the battles are still there every month of making the payments, you've already won. You've got the car. And as long as you continue in the covenant, it's yours until you choose to let it go. You see, here's what I know. I may never have the nicest stuff on planet Earth. You come to my house and you look at my carpet... Mark, you've been there. It ain't nice. But my feet are warm at night. I'll eventually get some new carpet or finish the hardwood floors or something. But if I don't, he already covered it. He's dismissed what the enemy can bring against me. And the only way I can give the enemy authority is to turn those things back over to him. So this morning, before we take communion, I want to give you an opportunity, first of all, to know Jesus. Because here's what I believe. I believe there are men and women here today that truly do not know Christ as their Lord and Savior. I also believe that there are men and women here that have known Christ as their Lord and Savior, and yet, for some reason, the enemy has kind of stolen. And now they're walking defeated. And they don't have to be. They just need to return to the Lord. Because he's waiting with open arms like a good father does, right? So I want to give an altar call for salvation this morning. Or rededication. We're not even going to separate the two. But if you don't have Christ living in your heart, how do you judge that? You have love one for another. If you want to do what he said to do, he said, if you love me, you'll want to be my disciple. And you'll know them by the love they have one for another. Love is the, de fact, the factor in deciding whether Christ is in your heart or not. Love. So I want to ask you to meditate for just a minute this morning. And if you just want, we're not going to invite you to go... Certainly the altars are open. You can come at any time. And if you need prayer for anything else while we're doing communion, you're welcome to come and pray before you take communion. And I'll explain that in a moment. But if you're not sure that if you left this world today that you would meet Christ, we're going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. If you've never accepted him or maybe you're struggling in your walk, maybe you've walked away and you just want to rededicate, will you just lift your hands? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these hands. Glory to God. Thank you. Thank you for these hands. You, you can put them down. Thank you. Anyone else? So everybody look this way. Let's pray this together. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Dismiss those things against me. And start me new today. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection power and for eternal life. Amen. Give him praise in the house. The prayer itself doesn't change anything. It's what you do in your heart with that. When you speak that to God genuinely from your heart, it changes you. And it sets you on a new, a new course. And all of a sudden, the flowers are a lot brighter in the middle of the rain. And, think, and you go, well, it's not going to be ugly anymore. I didn't say that. I just said you're going to see it a little differently. You know? Two ways of looking at it. My back is so sore. From coach hitting me in the top of the head with a tube of six. 
That's the way of looking. I mean, I'm sore, dude. I ain't going to lie. I'm sore. But I got a trailer full of really nice metal to build my building out of. See, there's two ways of looking at it. My friend cracked me in the head with a two by six, about a 12 foot long one. He really didn't. When you remove the metal, the rotted roof will fall on you. You shouldn't be standing there. He didn't really hit me, but I do think he pushed a little. <laughs> but, it, but I would love for you this week, if you prayed that prayer, to call us, text us, meet with us. If you genuinely want to grow in the Lord, we'll be happy to try to help you. We live in Sweet Home now. Things are a little bit easier for us. It's, it's uh, closer to be here. Um, and no matter what you've ever done to me, I still love you. Because the God in me wouldn't allow me to do any different, as my brother back there said earlier. Beautiful statement. With that being said, we're going to open the altar for needs in just a moment. And here's how we're going to do communion. I want to give you time to meditate on the Lord. I'm going to read you a little bit of scripture. I'm not going into the greatest. Uh, I, I think the Corinthians talks in depth about it more than, than this. But let me read you this scripture. At the end of my notes. Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, Jesus speaking. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He said, this you do to remember what I did for you. This you do in remembrance. In Corinthians, it says, don't do this unworthily. What that means is this. That doesn't mean he's out to get you. It means check your heart and make sure that things are okay between you and him. And so we're going to open the altars. We're going to give you a moment to, to meditate, pray. And when you're ready, representation of Christ sitting at the table, you're going to come, take the bread, the cup, pray as long as you want. Spend as much time as you want. We're not in a rush or a hurry. This is your remembrance of him delivering you. And then you put the cup back and you, you slowly walk out. You don't, don't get real loud and crazy because others are wanting to take the time to remember what they've done for him. So as they begin to play, I'm going to pray, they begin to pr play we're going to open the altars if you want to come there, if you want to sit where you're at. And if you need me to pray for you, I certainly will. But we want to keep everything as smooth as possible and allow folks to remember what God has done for them. Father, I come to you right now and thank you again for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the blood that was poured out for me. I, I know how rotten I was. And you knew how rotten I was before. And you did it anyway for me. Thank you for his body that was broken for me. God, that I may always serve you with every ounce of who I am. With every ounce of who I am. Touch your people today, Lord. Minister to their hearts. For those that made a fresh commitment today, God, I pray that you would move on them mightily. For those that just need to repent, move on them and let them repent. But God, let us always remember that when you got up, you defeated the last enemy. And that it is overcome and dismissed on our behalf if we continue to walk.